Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by Mr. Rob Bierenbaum. Rob, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Bart. Glad to be here. I enjoy your podcast, so this should be fun. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so right up front, I'll say what we're going to be talking about. You've got an amazing uh, background as you you started the drum headquarters in St. Louis, which was 81 to 2005. I right. owned it. I owned. I sold it in 2005. Correct. Okay. And then what really? I mean, that's super and interesting in itself, right there. But what really got my, you know, my interest peaked if we got to get this guy on the show was um, starting HQ Percussion, which is like real feel practice pads and sound right. off uh-huh. drum set silencers, almost like. Right. I mean, real feel practice pads are like a ubiquitous kind of like everyone had one at some point in their right, life, right? Right. Kind of deal. Um, so. Which I don't know which which comes first in the series of events and all that stuff. But why don't we just dive in and just tell us your story and how all this happened with your background? Sure. Well, like most people from my era, I'm a product of uh, February 9th, 1964, the day that the Beatles first appeared on American television. Uh, And that caused me to want to be a drummer. Uh, And I think about that every year on February 9th. And this year I started thinking that was like an incredible, organic, viral sensation. There was obviously no internet, but uh, what was there? Uh, Three television stations. Most cities had one or two newspapers. There was radio and there were magazines that come. Some came out once a week, some came out once a month. But this groundswell about the Beatles was just incredible. Um, like 73 million people in America watched that show and and the population was under 200 million. So that, you know, if that was today, that would have been well over 130 million people more than ever, um, watched the Super Bowl. So that event kind of catapulted, uh, It just it 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 changed the music industry. It changed my life, and it changed the music industry. And what was interesting is that my trajectory was kind of parallel with that of the music industry because prior to the Beatles, the music industry was quote band and orchestra, brass, woodwinds, strings, and percussion, and it flipped. That was the big paradigm shift, and it became what's called combo guitars, amps, drums, and then later Mm. portable keyboards. So, um, you know, like a lot of kids from that era, I started playing in bands, uh, did it all the way through high school, did it through college. Um, And I started uh, working in a drum shop in St. Louis in my junior year of college called Mr. Drums. It's long gone. Um, And I only worked there 14 months because I left then to go to graduate school. But uh, I learned a lot during those 14 months, things that I carried on into my business. And I think it's uh, worthwhile to point out the two things that I, that I learned. The first one was you can't take advantage of every deal. Uh, in the music industry and in a lot of businesses, the suppliers offer special deals to uh, stimulate sales, to move... Uh, dead merchandise, just to maybe gain real estate in a store or today on a website. Um, But you got to be careful about taking advantage of every deal. Because when I started working at Mr. Drums uh, in April of 74, three, I noticed three premier drum sets on the floor. Uh, And at that time, the market was dominated by the the big American three, Ludwig Rogers, Slingerland. Gretsch was a player, but not along the lines of the first three. And then Premier was an outlier and Sonar was an outlier even beyond Premier. But the owner of the store had just come back from a trip to the Premier factory in England because he had gotten in on a deal where you bought 12 Premier kits, you get one a month and you got a free trip to England. That's a, that's a heck of a deal. Yeah, that's a pretty good deal. Yeah, He paid a little (laughs) extra and his wife went. But, you know, I started in April, and there were three premiere kits on the floor, the one from January, the one from February, the one from March. And yeah. three, three months later, there were six premiere kits on the floor. Jeez. And before you knew it, we were choking on premiere kits. Um, <laughs> and, I'm all, and I'm all for 
doing what other people don't do and introducing new products, but committing to 12 premier kits in that market was not a prudent choice. Um, no, I mean, selling one premier kit a month and there's, again, for all the premier listeners like Mike Ellis, who did a premier episode, if you're uh-huh. listening, premier is great. We love oh, it. But like, I, I loved and, premier, but one a month. I mean, yeah, I, when I worked at, at music time. stores selling, I mean, you want to sell kits, but like a lot of people are buying the cheapo mm-hmm. beginner kits and things. So I think that don't take advantage of every deal is actually right. true in kind of like life. Exactly. In general. Exactly. You've got you to know, be careful. I mean, it's, 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 it's enticing, but it's not a de- in the retail world. It's not a deal until you sell it. I mean, buying is really important. The art of buying that everybody talks about. Sure. You have to buy right, but you can buy great. If you don't sell it, it ain't a deal. Yeah. So, but yeah, back to premiere just for a second. The chrome sure. plating was awesome. They had yeah. die cast hoops uh, on the higher end kits. Nobody had them at that time. Uh, the drums had a classy look. They were beautiful, but the public was uh, ingrained on Ludwig Rogers Slingerland. Um, yeah. We eventually worked through them, but, but there were a lot of premier kits there. Um, but the most important thing that I learned there was um, don't stray too far from your core mission. And, uh, this, this store was doing really, really well. There was another drum shop in town that had just started, Fred Pierce, who's still in business today, 50 years later. Wow. Kudo, kudos to Fred. But yeah. Fred was a full-time player and had just moved back to St. Louis, and Mr. Drums was really dominant. Somehow, the owner got the idea to open a full-line music store. Uh, guitars, amps, portable keyboards, um, PA. And he... That, that, that's risky enough, but that kind of makes some sense. So, sure. um, but he chose a market like 25 miles from where he was across the Missouri River and the farthest west reaches of uh, what's called St. Charles County, which today is well developed. Um, but this was a new development with new homes and a lake. And so the location was suspect. Yeah. Doing a full line music store was suspect, and to further complicate matters, he added pianos and home organs. So a big, a lot of real estate there. Unbelievable, and the piano and organ business is almost a separate industry from the musical <laughs> instrument industry. Yeah. So he took on so much that it killed Mr. Drums. I left. It's a shame. Uh, I only worked, like I said, I was only there fourteen months, but I left uh, the following June. And four or five months later, they were out of business and not, not because I left by any means. It was spot. <laughs> it was, yeah. I went, I went to graduate school cause I thought I would, you know, have a professional career and, um, sure. and the store was spiraling before I left because everything we did was that the, the, the new store was in an area called Lake St. Louis. And we used to joke in the store that everything we did was going into the lake <laughs> and that's what it was. Yeah. Um, but you could like take the good things and you, you witnessed how the industry works. I, yes. And I learned what not yes, to do. I learned what to do and I learned what not to do because the, yeah. the owner um, was strong on education. Uh, he was a uh, talented machinist and mechanic. So he was great at customizing drums and uh, repairing drums. So I, I, yeah, I learned what, I learned what to do, but I also learned what not to do. And I, I kind of kept that in the back of my mind. Um, sure. Got a master's degree, started working in a research firm, and after about four years of that, I kind of decided that uh, a bad day around drums was better than a good day around research. So yeah, I uh, had been thinking about you know opening my own store ever even back when I was working at at Mister Drums, but um, a second uh, drum shop had opened in town after Fred. Pierce got established and after Mr. Drums uh, closed. And I thought, well, there goes my opportunity because St. Louis can't support more than two drum shops. But this other one was located too close to Fred within a Mm -hmm. few miles in the Northwest uh, suburb kind of. But I started teaching at this store, Ken Mazinas, a great guy. He had a really strong educational program. But after a few months there, I realized he really didn't have a handle on the retail component. He really didn't understand Mm. it. Um, And 
I decided I just needed to maybe go ahead and do this. So pre-internet again, <laughs> I got a map of St. Louis out. I got a bunch of push pins and I put a push pin where each of the two drum shops were. And then I put a push pin where all of the full line music stores that had strong drum departments were located. Cause that was a thing back then. There were some really great full line music stores that had great drum departments. Um, and I, mapped it out, put all the push pins in and just jumping out at me was the central part of the county, kind of where I lived and, and hung out. There were no music stores. And this was like right near a major highway, um, close to the clubs, close to the kind of apartments where musicians live, uh, direct in line with all the major venues where national and regional acts play. Um, and I thought this is crying out for a music store. So uh, I quit uh, my job, my research job. And I told Ken Mazinas that I was going to quit teaching, obviously, because I was going to open a store. And uh, that, so I opened Drum Headquarters in January of 1981, um, hmm, which is awesome. kind of well, odd to do it in January. Yeah, but but uh, at post Christmas, exactly. I guess, and all that. But but it's smart what you did though in general because like I mean sometimes seems obvious, but like not everyone has that thought of like like sometimes people would think I'm going to do this drum store uh, and I live here, so I'm going to do it right. five minutes from right. my house. Right. But you really need to look at it and go, no, it needs yeah. to be it's smart. It happened to be fairly close to where I lived and where I sure. hung out, but uh, it which it just was the right area. And I've talked to other people. Uh, around the country. I mean, Dana Bentley at Bentley's Drum Shop uh, in uh, in Fresno did the same thing. He moved from another city because he knew that for that market. And uh, Shane at uh, Drum Center in Portsmouth, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, he was living in Portland, Maine, but he, you know, he picked the market. So sometimes you have to do that regardless of the business. And again, that was more important pre-internet um, yeah. where you were located because uh, the manufacturers had quote franchise agreements and you couldn't open up down the street from somebody and be selling the same lines. So sure. uh, that, that factored into my consideration as well. Well, how'd it go? So you opened up 1981, uh, yeah. that, but that's interesting too, because Japanese brands are coming in more. Exactly. And, and exactly. Um, yeah. Ludwig was in a severely weakened position as was Rogers, as was Slingerland. Um, so I couldn't really get any lines right away. I was able to get Slingerland because they were actually distributed by St. Louis Music at the time. You could buy direct from Slingerland, but they were also just distributed through St. Louis Music. It was just coincidental in town. I could pick it up without paying freight, but Slingerland was a little bit more open to, uh, to new dealers. I couldn't get Ludwig, uh, Rogers. I didn't want because they were, they were, uh, suffering as well. Um, yeah. and I knew, I, I knew that I had to have Tama. That was that Tama was the buzz at that time. Sure. Um, Yamaha was too, but they were really difficult to, uh, to, to get to. So I really knew I had to have Tama and it took, um, it took nine months. I, 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 I secured it wow. at the June NAM show, the first NAM show I ever went to six months after opening, but, uh, in order for them to, uh, smooth out the market a little bit. I couldn't get the product until September, but, uh, that, that was just perfect timing. It was just serendipity. Tama was so hot at the time, uh, with the hardware yeah. and the superstar and Imperial star drums and the swing star entry level. Um, I just really embraced it. And, uh, in fairly short order, we became the, the, uh, probably the, well, definitely the top Tama dealer in St. Louis and probably the state. Um, That's awesome. And it was I mean, just, it's... it was a strong line. I didn't have Pearl and I didn't have Yamaha. So, you know, I wow. really threw myself in, 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 into Tama. It's kind of a bet, like a gamble, I feel like, with, with, with uh, music stores, where if you have a brand that like, like I used to work at a drum store here in Cincinnati and around the corner was a guitar store mm -hmm. that, that I believe Carvin, I think, was the guitar line. Uh, if I'm not Carvin Ash, that... yeah. Yeah, and and but that was what they went all in on. Right. It was no Fender, right. it was no Gibson, right. it was nothing. Right. And it was like you are hanging your hat on that brand, like where it, sometimes it pays off, sometimes it doesn't as much. 
uh, clearly you picked your, your gamble paid off. Well, I got lucky. Tama was so hot <laughs> at the time and I just cultivated a, a relationship with the rep and it took time because uh, the other drum shop in town had Tama, but you know, it wasn't that close. And then far up in North County, there was a full line dealer just doing fantastic with Tama. Um, and there were a handful yeah. of other dealers, uh, but yeah, yeah you, 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 that's a good way to start. But eventually, you, especially if you're a specialty store, I can see a full line shop trying to specialize in only certain brands because they can't have everything because they got to cover so many instruments. But a drum shop really, you, you have to have, you have to do everything your competition does, and you have to do everything they don't do. And that, and yeah. once Guitar Center became a, a force, and they they moved out of you know California, Texas, and Illinois where they were where they first focused once they started moving out. Um, that was my, that was my, my model. I had to have, I had to have and do everything they had and did. And I had to do everything they didn't do. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, like, all right. So this is probably a random question, but with all of your experience and your success and you're kind of following your gut and being right, what's something you would say to young, younger drum shops today with a little bit of advice with all your experience that you see them doing now mm -hmm. where you go, man, I wouldn't maybe do that, you know? Well, I kind of have three business mantras and uh, two of them apply to any business and one of them only applies to businesses that sell product. But the first one is sweat the details and the big things will fall into place. There's a lot of really creative people out there who have great ideas, um, but oftentimes they don't have the wherewithal to see them through because they, they're, they're, they're visionary types and they don't, yeah. they don't know how to build the foundation. Um, and a lot of times these people have someone with them, either a partner or someone else who, who sweats those details. But if you sweat the details, the small things, the big things will either fall into place or it'll be a lot easier to achieve them. Um, and the second one is, especially in the music industry, which people don't realize how tiny it is, the musical instrument industry itself is minuscule related to clothing, sound, you know, uh, uh, consumer electronics, computers, whatever. It's tiny. Yeah. And the right. drum industry is a <laughs> subset of this tiny thing. Yeah. So I've this, learned that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's small. When you look at the other than Yamaha and uh, Roland, when you look at the gross sales of some of these companies, which we think are fantastic, most businesses in consumer products you know, would, would sneeze at that. That's, that's their sure. weekly or monthly sales or equivalent to the annual sales of, of musical instrument companies. Um, yeah. So the second mantra is don't burn your bridges because you might have to cross them later. Uh, it's a sure. small industry. Everybody knows everybody else. People on the manufacturing and wholesale side move around. You don't want to alienate somebody at company a because in six months they're they could be a company b so yeah. just don't you know i'm not saying you have to acquiesce and and sacrifice your ethics for sure or your values but just don't burn the bridges because you're going to need to go you're going to need to cross them at another time yeah um and the third thing i tried to live by uh is you can't sell from an empty cart you've got to have the merchandise and my goal was for people to think I are, you know, I, I, I need this. I'll go to drum headquarters. They, they, I didn't want them to think twice is drum headquarters going to have this or not. They're going to have it. Now, obviously we didn't have it every single time, but I didn't, yeah. I, I wanted yeah. to, to nurture that among uh, the consumers. And today it's even more important with the internet because of the, immediate delivery offered by uh, Amazon and the extremely deep inventories, even though yeah. it tends to be more focused on things like, like Sweetwater and Musician's Friend and, and others, um, you know, they don't have the broad range that special, specialty stores have, but they have uh, very deep, immediately available inventory. You can't expect people to, it's, wor it's, it's so much worse today. You can't expect people to wait. You've got to have the gear. Yeah. So that's where maybe specializing is important, where you deep in two brands. You get really deep in snare drums or really yeah. deep in cymbals if you can't cover the whole gamut. But 
you got to have the gear. So, so the, the, those kind of three, those three things kind of drove me every day. Those are great. And I think that's, uh, like you said, it's kind of cross business. And I, I do see that though, where on some of the big brand, uh, you know, retail websites, you go and you're looking for a specific kind of more boutique brand and they don't have it. Right. But then these drum shops do who sell online. So now you're obviously in the world of online right, sales right. and all that stuff. But um, I think that's that's extremely smart. And and it's it is funny how small our industry is and, and how word does spread. I mean, seriously, you'll oh, just yeah. get a message about, did you hear this? And it's like, <laughs> exactly. Uh, no, no, we, we, used, we used to joke. Tama would sneeze and Pearl would say, God bless you. Yeah. And that's just yeah, the way exactly. that's the way it is. And, you know, something especially with the with the overseas companies, and it's true of the American companies as well. Sure, they compete, but they're all talking to each other. They're all in yeah. communication. Um, the blood isn't as bad as, as people might think bet- between, you know, one company and the other. Um, sure, sure. Well, all right. So then um, let's, I want to make sure we, you know, with, have plenty of time to talk mm-hmm. about HQ and everything, but like, so were you doing clinics in your yeah, shop we did, and everything? We did, yeah. Yeah. E- education in general was really important. We, um, you know, I, I went through three locations all within this, within a mile. Uh, and by the time we got the first location had one teaching studio, it was a converted little house that, you know, drums take up too damn much space it's not like jewelry yeah. where you can put 10 million dollars <laughs> of jewelry in a you know a thousand square foot space so we had yeah. to get out of that house and we moved to another uh spot that had two teaching studios and we expanded that spot to get to three and then when i got to the final location we had four studios and about 220 students a week Wow. So education was really important. And uh, I did open a second store uh, in 1997, and that only had two studios. It was smaller, but it was about 25 miles away. And uh, we had about 130. So we were teaching over 350 lessons a week. I yeah, come from so a, that's- a background of education. I taught drums. I have two degrees in education. I worked in educational research. I valued that. Plus, it's a it's a business uh, stimulant. That's, yeah. I was going to say, that's how you pay your bills <laughs> right. is like the consistent. They're coming not, in I mean, every week. They yeah. need sticks. They need heads. They need practice pads. They need books. And then they need a drum set. And, um, so yeah, the, the education component was important. The clinics, I was always into the clinics. I thought it was, uh, a, a cool marketing vibe. Uh, yeah. you can't make money on clinics. You don't make money on clinics. You can't plan on it. There's just no other way to get three, four, or five hundred drummers in the same room feeling good yeah. about drumming, drums, and your store than a clinic. So if you spend ten grand, you could have spent that ten grand on the radio and, and had less impact. Sure. So clinics well, to me were critical. We did um, we did a variety of types. You know, you do the big ones in outside venues that that are, you know, two to five hundred. Um Though we did have some in the six and seven hundred range, and then we wow. do the in-store master classes with thirty or forty people, are the real high-level master classes with you know with like a Steve Smith or something with maybe eight mm-hmm. or ten people, kind of the thing Todd Zuckerman is doing now. Sure. Um, so yeah, we did we did uh, probably f- five to eight events like that a year, I would say. Wow. Um, what was your, if you have to choose out of your entire, you know, 81 to 2005, yeah. what was your favorite one that sticks in your mind? Well, there, 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 there are many, but the, the one of the earliest w- was uh, Simon Phillips uh, with, cool. Dom, with Dom Famulero. It was actually our second clinic, our first major clinic. And when Tama asked me to be part of that, I felt quote, you know, we, we have arrived because there was only seven <laughs> or eight dates in the country. And yeah. um, uh, we had 380 people, 1980, November 83. And uh, it just blew people away. Uh, That's awesome. He was Mr. Tama. I mean, literally, his yeah. pants would say Tama. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Simon was, um, was incredible. Uh, That's great. But nobody knew who Dom was. Uh, Dom at that time was only doing school clinics, uh, on Long Island. Um, 
And he was on behalf of Long Island Drum Center, which had five stores at the time. And Long Island was a strong Tama dealer. And to Thomas' credit, they saw Dom's potential. And so they put him on this clinic tour with Simon. The first time he was ever outside of Long Island doing a clinic, first time he was virtually ever outside of a school, except I'm sure he did. He opened some clinics for Long Island Drum Center in New York. Nobody knew who Dom was. Nobody was there because of Dom. There were 380 people there. I introduced Dom. And in five minutes, he had the audience eating out of the palm of his hand. Yeah. And in 20 minutes, they were screaming for more. <laughs> and that started a long, long relationship with Dom. He, he yeah. did. He came to the store once or twice a year for a number of years, doing master classes, doing full clinics, teaching, um, helping our, our instructors. Um, that, that Simon and Dom clinic, people today still, drummers today still tell me that clinic was like a watershed event in their life, just not as a drummer, mainly as a drummer, but just not as a drummer. They were so inspired by Simon's playing, by Dom's presentation, and they were the right age, maybe 14 yeah. to 18 or 20 at the time. Exactly. And invariably, I still get texts or emails or bump into somebody, and they're still talking about that 40 years ago, 40 <laughs> years later. But it's Ringo effect. It's what happened with you as a kid <laughs> yeah, watching exactly, Ed Sullivan. Exactly. It's like, it's just, it catches you exactly. and it just, it, yeah. and Dom has been on and is the greatest guy and, and glad he's feeling better yes, and yes, his yes, health has gotten right better. On. But also it's just, that isn't, this is a whole nother topic, but that's an interesting career path to go the, I'm going to be an educator, clinician. He created, the, I mean, there were, there were major yeah. clinicians before him like Roy Burns, but he virtually created that, um, what they call him drumming's global ambassador but he virtually yes. created that position and and i didn't see that for a minute but when i was standing off side stage when he was doing his clinic i thought this guy is something special and yeah. if you want to segue into hq percussion this is the springboard right here like i said dom just really had a a lot of impact on people. And one of the teachers at drum headquarters, Mike Earhart, who passed away a few years ago, he said, I got to take lessons from this guy. He was just smitten with Dom's technique, his concepts, the exercises he handed out, his presentation, his personality, the whole package. So, you know, he talked to Dom after the clinic and Dom said, sure. So Mike went to uh, Long Island, spent a weekend at Dom's house, uh, took lessons from Dom probably 18 hours a day, whether they were in the car or in Dom's house, but also at Long Island Drum Center. Um, and Mike came back from Long Island. This was probably early 84, and he was just fired up, obviously. And he was a great, dedicated teacher anyway, with up to 40 students a week and playing gigs wow. and owning a recording studio. But he was an exceptional individual, and he said, he came back with this round gum rubber practice pad, no name, no nothing, no label. And he said, I want you to stock these practice pads because I'm going to recommend them to my students. And I did. It's, he said it's from a company called Casino Percussion. So I, I had heard of it. I knew about them. And it was owned by Jerry Ricky, who owned all the five Long Island drum centers. So I did a little research and I said, Mike, do you really think people are going to buy $25 practice pads? <laughs> this was 1984. And which is, I mean, that's, I mean, I'm bad time, with the, I always have to use Google, but that's a lot, that's the, a lot the, of money. The choice was Remo or those cheap vacuum Gladstone style pads. Those were the two choices yeah. at the time. Yeah. So Mike said, uh, and he didn't intend this to be leverage. He said, well, if you don't want to stock them, I'll order them from Jerry. Well, that was the magic word. I said, no, 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 I'll, I'll get them. No, I'll no, get no, them. No. <laughs> so I order three and we sell them. I order six and we sell them. I order 12 and we sell them. Four years later, I own the company. Um, but there's no branding on it. There's no, they well, didn't Well, what have happened them. was after, exactly, it was round. It had gum rubber. They had the model with the neoprene on the bottom, no name. So about two years later, maybe let's say around 86, uh, Jerry changed the shape, made it eight-sided. Now, at that time, you got to remember Simmons was just 
beginning to explode in the market. Their pads were six sided. Their mm-hmm. electronic drum pads were six sided. Yep. So a shape like that in the consumer's mind meant forward thinking, cutting edge, new. So Jerry, he's a creative sort. He made it eight sided. He thought that was kind of a, an image that people would, would, would think positively about. And yeah. he came up with the name Power Play. So for a couple of years, they were called Power Play and they were eight sided. Um, so I got, I, once, my, once I started ordering these pads and, and getting closer with Dom, who was teaching at Long Island Drum Center, I became uh, close with Jerry. And uh, Long Island Drum Center is still going strong with just the one location now run by Jerry Zeno Percussion. Um, he had the five stores and he had this idea of starting um, what he called the National Drum Association. Uh, at that time, PAS was really focused on education and orchestral marching, a little bit of world and a little bit of drum set. It was nothing like it is today. And he wasn't trying to compete with PAS, but he wanted to start this organization. And he had a great idea, but it really never materialized. But he said, why don't you buy casino percussion? Um, and we were good friends at the time. And he gave me this incredibly ridiculous price. That's good. Um, so I flew to New York, and uh, when I got there, I realized that drum headquarters was the aberration. The company was, I hadn't even asked for any sales figures when I bought it. <laughs> so we get there, and I start looking through the books, and I realize that they're selling a few things to stores in New York and New Jersey, and maybe a couple other pockets around the country. And drum headquarters was kind of the aberration outside of uh, – outside of New York and really outside wow. of the long, the five Long Island drum centers, which were selling a, a lot of the product. But um, so I loaded up a U-Haul truck and my wife flew, uh, flew up and we drove back to St. Louis and I had uh, gotten a little space in the basement of a friend's uh, architecture practice and uh, didn't want to use the name casino percussion. It had no meaning to me. And I, came up with HQ percussion from drum headquarters. We used to that call it sense. drum HQ and I, I wanted to keep them totally separate, but I wanted to, you know, have it in the family, so to speak. Didn't like the name power play. It sounded one dimensional to me. Um, so we came up with the name real feel. Uh, and then they had these uh, sponge drum mufflers, which they just called drum mufflers. And they only had six through 18 inch round discs. They didn't have cymbal, hi hat, or bass drum. So we renamed that sound off, uh, drum set silencers, and we uh, eventually developed the bass drum, the cymbal, and the hi hat. So mm, wow. when I got the uh, the uh, ship, when I got the truck, brought the truck back, and we loaded everything in, we, we had some inventory to sell, but. Um, we had to learn. We knew nothing. I knew nothing about manufacturing. And this was rudimentary manufacturing. I don't want to blow it out of proportion. It was rudimentary, but I knew nothing about raw materials. I you were making it. them, though. Yeah. Like they were, they're not made in China no, or something. No, no, no. So I wow. knew nothing about it. So I had to embark on learning about raw materials, how to source them, how to make the products. I felt like I had a good handle on how to market them because being in retail, I understood what appealed to the store. And I also understood what manufacturers did that endeared themselves to the retailer. So I thought I could handle the marketing end, but I knew nothing about the production or the raw materials. So Hmm. I uh, got out the yellow pages again, pre-internet, and I started looking for rubber suppliers in St. Louis. And there were more than you would think. Um, and they're all in these gritty, funky, industrial neighborhoods. Uh, so I picked three that just happened to be close to each other in a central part of the city. And I called on all three of them. Um, and this is another major business lesson. <laughs> so I go in there. I know nothing. I don't know what the materials are that we need. I don't know their specifications. Density or... Nothing. I don't know yeah. anything. Um, yeah. And I do know two things, though. It's got to feel good under a pair of drumsticks, and it's got to look good. 
Well, those are two things that are foreign to rubber suppliers. Because people that sell rubber and sponge, it's concealed. They're selling to automobile manufacturers, furniture manufacturers. They're, they're making grommets and uh, gaskets and seals for machinery. Sure. Uh, it doesn't matter what it looks like, and it doesn't matter what it feels like. No, because it's covered by a seat <laughs> right. or something. Or, exactly. Yeah, 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 so wow. I go into these three places um, not knowing anything, and to add to that, equation i've got a ponytail um <laughs> two of the people i could tell just are not taking me seriously yeah i also couldn't tell them how much i want I, I just couldn't tell them anything the third guy took me seriously and i got a bid from him within a week or so i guess by mail and uh i understood it it made sense to me i couldn't get a bid out of the other two places I pushed and I pushed and I pushed and finally one of the two sent me a bid that was so vague. It was just a knee jerk. Let me give this guy something and move on with my life. So now you too small to even like be on their they radar. Did, I think they were. They I th yes, I think it's a lot of things. Yeah, I, sure. they, they didn't want to deal with someone who was clueless. Yeah, they I didn't gotcha. want to deal with these challenges of it's got to feel a certain way and it's got to be consistently cosmetically appealing. Yeah, yeah. and they just. You know, I guess they thought they had enough business. But the third guy took me seriously. Um, mm -hmm. And we used to joke about that because he stayed with this supplier, our rubber supplier. He stayed with that company the whole time I owned HQ Percussion for 16 years. Nice. And eventually we were buying $500,000 a year worth of rubber, <laughs> neoprene, awesome. and sponge. Why? Awesome. Because the guy took me seriously. And we would joke, we would laugh about this because he made, his company made millions of dollars over the year from HQ Percussion. He made a lot of commission. We worked our way up to being their third largest customer. I'm sure we were wow. far away from the first and second because it was probably Chrysler. And yeah, uh, yeah. there was a Chrysler plant in St. Louis. There was a Chevy plant. But um, we worked our way up to the third largest customer they had. And the, the, the sales guy, our account manager, I mean, he, he said it in a beautifully simplistic way. He said, well, that's my job. He basically did his job. The other two didn't do their jobs. And look what, yeah. it, you know, so. Yeah, my I mean, God, that's awesome. To, I love you, to that. use a, a baseball analogy on opening day here, you can't get yeah. a hit if you don't swing the bat. So this exactly. guy swung the bat and he got a grand slam. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, wow. And another thing is this company and this individual named Ken himself, they became true partners in, um, in HQ percussion. You hear that term thrown around, you know, our business partners, manufacturers say it about retailers. It's a lot of lip service. It's just another way of saying customer. But this company was truly an extension of, of HQ percussion. Uh, they got educated on what we needed and they would reject uh, this. The gum rubber comes in in these huge sheets. And if they saw undulations on it where it's going up and down or cosmetic imperfections, they would reject it and send it back to the manufacturer. Because these, these local rubber suppliers, they really aren't, they're not rubber manufacturers. They're yeah, die cutters. Sourcing it and getting it in they're the right. They're cutting it. So we had yeah. to buy all these dyes. That's what their job really is, is die cutters and Got sourcing it. the material, dealing yeah. with the manufacturer. The manufacturer wouldn't talk to, to me. I, w I was way too small. Yeah, because the manufacturer, I mean, these then we're talking like international, right, global, right, right. monster companies. But, the, but, but they're buying, they were, you know, our supplier was buying from these manufacturers for most of their customers. So, yeah. Uh, it got to a point where our volume was such that our local supplier, our die cutter, was able to go to the manufacturer of the gum rubber and convince them to clean the machinery before they made our order. So oh, what they would do is at the end of the day, before our order was being made, they would shut down that machine at 3, three o'clock, let's say a couple hours before closing, 2 o'clock, whatever. And they would clean the machine and then they would come in the next morning and run our our order so that's really dramatically reduced the foreign uh 
material that got into the rubber and they paid, they started because when they were getting stuff sent back that wasn't cosmetically or physically right, they started learning the manufacturer how to, how to make our order. Um, sure. So that, that uh, local supplier was, was really a true partner. They, That's they did so much for us. Um, yeah. I mean, do you, uh, I feel like nowadays there are people who make pads in America and, and there's all kinds of things like that, but it just seems like everything has gotten so much more expensive and things go overseas. And um, it seems like, I guess it was a different world then where yeah, things were manufactured yeah, more yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. There were, um, there were not as many pads that, Today, there are so many gum rubber. I mean, there were gum rubber practice pads before us. Um, yeah. uh, a guy named Ralph Pace um, made made some practice pads, set the pace practice pads yeah. in the and 50s and 60s. Kits and yes, things like exactly. that, that would like unfold. Yeah, they were really cool. right. And they yeah. were gum rubber. And I think that I think what became the real feel was probably patterned after that. Um, but we we became really particular about about the it's called durometer of the of the rubber that's their measurement and and, mm. and we had to you know get the right thickness um and they just learned how to make what was what what we needed um we never would have achieved that without this uh die yeah. cutter supplier we had sure. uh, you know and then we and then we needed the the bases made the particle board bases i, I didn't have a wood shop so this company yeah. this gum su gum supplier they they recommended us to one of their companies one of their customers who made uh, wood products and had a wood shop in their on their farm and they were making our 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 wooden bases um man and then so you get all the pieces then right. so you'd get your top your right. your the gum rubber and then the, you said the bottom was neoprene yeah, uh, or? well there was there there was there was two major playing surfaces gum rubber and neoprene which is real okay. hard Got and it. then we obviously introduced the brush pad so we you know our supplier had to source that material um yeah. But the biggest, the biggest challenge on other than so finally I got the raw materials kind of together, and so when we when I came back from New York with all this inventory and and supplies, there was this you know can of adhesive. So I thought, okay, that's what they use, you know, and that's what they were using. That's what we'll use. Um, it was this white, thick adhesive, kind of looked like Elmer's glue in an industrial can, and we you know we painted on the entire surface and and glue the pads um and we started having problems with adhesion it mm. wasn't holding um and i learned that rubber is a difficult material to adhere to other surfaces yeah um especially because it's taking a beating well even even the material itself it's got pla what's called plasticizers in it and the most important thing is in the in the uh, at the end of the manufacturing process they put a thin layer of talc on it or it would stick together you'd have this four oh, by see. eight sheet of rubber stuck to you know folded over stuck together you couldn't even get it so the talc repels adhesion so we were having problems with the gum rubber coming off the base gotcha. um so our supplier uh said well what about pressure sensitive adhesive called psa um they said we can install that onto the rubber, onto the big sheet, and then cut it into your eight-sided shape and your different sizes. And all you do is peel off the release paper and stick it on the base. And we thought, this is a beautiful thing. Yeah. We don't have to be dealing with glue. We don't have to be painting it on. I mean, it was really this, about the same cost because they were installing the P. We had to buy the PSA. They were installing the PSA. But yeah. The product, but we could like rapidly increase production, and and we were getting, you know, demands on that because the the uh, vol our volume was increasing. We couldn't keep up with it. So we. But thought, it's all by hand, though. So it's someone takes it, right? They unpeel it, they right. slap it on the the wood. Exactly. Wow. But that's a lot yeah. easier than having to paint glue onto something and uh, sure. slop it around. And um, sure. So that we thought that was our savior. So we went for the PSA. And it started failing. <laughs> oh, so uh, this this was a two or three year process. I mean, we had product out in the market, and it wasn't every single one, but it was enough failing that we had to solve this. So again, our gum rubber supplier stepped up, and they connected us with a major glue international glue manufacturer that 
I will say was not 3M, but mm. another major one. And uh, they sent out an industrial engineer and he looked at our product and he looked at our wood ba- our particle board bases. He looked at our gum rubber and our neoprene. We gave him a bunch of samples. He took it home to his uh, uh, workshop and he experimented with all kinds of adhesives for uh, a week or so, or maybe longer. And he came back with a recommendation. Um, and my, my non-disclosure agreement with Diderio is far expired. So I can tell you that this was <laughs> what's called a CE adhesive, cyanoacrylate ester. Um, it's, it's similar to what you find in super glue, gorilla glue, whatever. Yep. Um, a major difference though, is it has no preservatives because and that, and preservatives can break down the bond as well. So, you know, you, you, you go buy a tube of super glue in the hardware store. How do you know how long it's been since it was made? It could have sat at the manufacturer for two months. It could have sat at the distributor for six months. It could have sat in the retail store. It could be a year old. And preservatives make that possible for it to just Right. But preservatives forever. aren't really good for the, uh, the kind of bond that we needed and for manufacturing. Yeah. Yeah. So we uh, went ahead with this huge industrial company and they wouldn't sell to us they then referred us to one of their distributors who happened to be in st louis and we would we were buying basically 15 pounds every 15 days so it came in a pound bottle so every 15 days we got 15 bottles so 30 pounds a month 100 dollars per pound was the cost of the glue this was incredible. This was like 10 times the previous, <laughs> but it, but we tested yeah. it. And yeah. it, I mean, we, um, you could, we tried to pull the gum rubber off the base. We'd get up pliers and try to pull it off and the wood would come with the, the rubber. The, it, we, we solved the bonding problem right there. Incredible. But we were spending $3,000 a month on glue. Yeah. Um, wow. But, but we had the best bond in the business, so to speak. So um, we discovered that the consistency of the glue, plus the fact that it was so darn expensive, we could not paint it across the entire uh, surface of the gum rubber. It would have been way too costly and it just wouldn't have worked, you know. Um, So we came up with a spider web pattern kind of that we used probably one third of the glue that we had previously used on each pad, maybe 25% as much. But nonetheless, we had this spider web pattern that covered the entire uh, surface and was especially prevalent along the edges so it didn't flip up. Mm. And that's what we started using. And uh, we gave them out to teachers at drum headquarters. We gave them out to the employees at HQ Percussion. We gave them out to some customers. And everybody reported this is the same as any real feel, it's fantastic. I don't know what you're talking about. So we we made the decision. We went ahead. We signed the contract, and we started using that glue. Mm, wow! And I get a call one day from Joe Morello. Uh, everybody knows Joe Morello had some yep. of the greatest technique in history, um, and most people know that Joe didn't mince words. <laughs> so I answer the, and he was one of our endorsers, and I I answer the phone. Uh, and he doesn't even say hello. He just says, what the hell did you do to those pads? I can hear voids and feel them. Because of the spider web pattern? Exactly. And- Not only oh, did geez. he have an incredible touch, but he had an unbelievable ear. Nobody prior to that, nobody after that, and I'm talking hundreds of thousands of pads that sold, ever said anything. Wow. <laughs> but Joe Morello knew that we did something different. Jeez. That, I don't think I it's mean, past he, Joe. <laughs> he was in some rarefied air. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. That was that that was that was uh a phone call I'll never forget. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And it's just a Joe thing, but I wonder if his loss of his sight had anything with heightened other senses. I, I think it could. I mean, the yeah. man, you know, he was a child prodigy on violin. He played yes. with the Boston Symphony at age nine, um, didn't start playing drums till 15. 
but he was a consummate artist. Yeah. And he was the only person who could feel or hear the difference on that pad. Did you change it or no, did you? No, we couldn't. We couldn't. I'm going to say, but, <laughs> but it's interesting how changing that pattern to not smear it all over, but right. to do the interesting pattern can be a cost saving because oh, a cost yeah. saving thing yeah. because at scale it all right. matters. Well, the real, the real cost saving then came, uh, and, I, and I can say this publicly now, uh, Mitch McMitchin, who's the president of Minel now, Minel USA, uh, owned a company called TreeWorks Chimes. He still owns it. So Drum Headquarters was buying TreeWorks Chimes, and Mitch became a good friend. And uh, he knew about, you know, we talked about manufacturing stuff, and he knew about uh, the glue, and, the, and it was $113 a pound at this point. And this was early on, early again in the internet. So Mitch starts Googling, and he finds me a glue that's thirteen dollars a pound. <laughs> wow! That was made in Taiwan. So there's a U.S. distributor, uh, a Taiwanese family, and I contact them in California, and they send me a sample, and we do the whole test again, where we run our spider pattern, and we glue them up, and we give them out to teachers and players and employees, and we try to pull it up with the pliers, and I requested what's called an MSDS from the uh, Manufacturer Material Safety Data Sheet, which gives mm. the specifications of what's in the product. Yeah. And I'm no scientist, but I poured over this thing for a few hours, and I basically came to the conclusion that it's about 95 plus percent the same glue that we're paying $113 a pound for. So you're $100 less. Yeah, a pound. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to save three. We're going to save. Yeah. Yeah, Jeez. three thousand. Yeah, so uh, I had a contract with the other supplier, which fortunately was up in a few months. So we we finished out that contract and we switched over to this other glue. And again, we used that. That was probably I'd say mid to late '90s. So we used that for another ten years without any uh, any issues. But that mm. was a that was another lesson. <laughs> yeah, shop around. I mean, you know, it's you can the amount of savings yeah. you can have from. But yeah. thank you to the internet too. It's right, a different exactly. era. Yeah. Yeah. The world got smaller. Right. So I, I, I still thank Mitch to this day for <laughs> yeah. saving me $3,000 a month. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. But how was business? So, I mean, what was the, you know, kind of the, the run from beginning to when you sold it? Right. I mean, it really became super popular. Yeah. It was, um, well, we, we took it slow. I mean, we didn't do a press release for a year. And we didn't do an ad for a year and a half. Um, we we uh, perfected, well, we improved the manufacturing. Uh, th we improved the raw material uh, sourcing. We improved the, the the product. We came up with the with the catchy names. Um, we we labeled them. Um, we contacted dealers. I, I obviously knew a lot of dealers. Um, from just being in, in, on the retail side. Um, and I made it clear from the very beginning that there was this line and it was a thick, firm, hard line between drum headquarters and HQ percussion products. We did not sell HQ percussion products through drum headquarters at a wholesale price. We sold it in the same range that the other retail stores sold it because we didn't want to compete with our customers. Um, and, we, and we knew some reps and re those, re you know, we knew the reps in the Midwest, but they knew other reps. So we kind of had a rep network in the beginning that was taking the product into the stores. Um, and then we did a, uh, a serious advertising campaign that started around 1990. Um, and we were in Modern Drummer every single issue until I sold the company. Um, yeah. And I always saw it there. Consistency was the key. And I had seen that through drum headquarters. You see a company make a splash and then they go away. You see a company start with a product. Now, maybe the product wasn't, wasn't viable, but they start with a half page or a full page, full color ad. They blow their advertising budget. We started with a sixth of a page. Um, we had a, cus a drum headquarters customer who was a great advertising person. And uh, he came up with these fantastic headlines like it's the field that counts 
Um, I came up with it's the teacher's aid. So we had one. It's the yeah. it's the feel that counts. And we had you know six or eight of our endorsers. You know we, had, we yeah. had built up this endorser uh, uh, stable, and that was kind of rare to, for a practice pad to have an endorser <laughs> to yeah, have but endorsers. It makes sense. Anything can have an endorser, and. I have found with with getting advertisers on the podcast and things like that, that sometimes if someone buys one ad, it's like you really do need to have some consistency and should almost get like a month or something. But but I think back to Modern Drummer and I think of like uh, like Forks Drum Closet, who has sponsored right. on this podcast, right. I, ironically, right. but Gary but was, it would be yeah. the yeah. the guy jumping and pointing. Right. And it's like, right. I remember that right. every right. single think catalog. about think about Coca-Cola. Yes. Do they ever stop telling no. you that they're there? Anheuser-Busch, I mean, they've got more competition than they used to, but, you know, they don't, Coca-Cola doesn't stop telling you that, that we're here yeah. and, and we just never stopped. And the ads, the ads were much, the, the ads were way above the quality of a company our size, still not the level of Siljan and Pearl and Tama and Peisty and all the others, but, but they You're were playing with the big boys. They though. were quality ads done by a professional, um, you know, who charged us, but he was a customer and a drummer and he really loved the project. Um, so yeah. we, we did that. And then we started advertising the sound off. Um, we made some connections with PIT at Musicians Institute, Percussion Institute of Technology. Um, they had a store there and it was sold in the store. All the teachers there were using them. Um, Ed Sof at University of North Texas. Um, you know, they started showing up, you know, you, you, you see, Drummers, you know, in Modern Drummer, they're doing an article and they're backstage and the, guy, the guy's playing on a real field. It, it all just kind of kind of snowballed. Um, so it was, a, it was a combination of the reps taking them into the stores, our relationship with the dealers um, and, and the ads and the endorsers that, that got people's uh, attention. Yeah, but the big picture, though, you can advertise something all day long, but if it's not good... It word will spread right, in our right, small right. industry. Exactly. So clearly, the exactly. product was good enough to support it and right. and and actually put right. your kind of money where your mouth is. Because otherwise, you do see that where brands advertise and it's not whatever that right. great of a product. No, we, but we yeah, you're, you're totally right. We knew that that you, I mean yeah, you can't toot your horn unless you have something to toot about. So we had to <laughs> you know the product had to look right. It had to be consistent. For the dealer, it had to be packaged, you know, shipped and boxed and packed correctly so it didn't get damaged. It had yep. to be shipped quickly. Um, we were we were diligent about that. Um, the faster you ship, the faster you get reorders. So, you know, all, all those things are really, really important. Yeah. Well, what happened then? So so you led that it, you did sell to uh, Diodario. I, I think I'm saying that right. D I always Diodario. Yeah, Dario. Yeah. I, I call. I didn't add once, and I called and heard them say it on the phone, and then hung up. And right. that's how you say it. <laughs> right uh, so, Dario, how do you? Um, how did that go? How did that experience well, go? Well, I, I kind of felt that after about fifteen years, that um, we we had really taken it as, as far as far as we could take it, um, and there were people that could do it better than us uh, in terms of manufacturing and packaging. Um, and, uh, we, you know, the competition was starting to surface a little bit, uh, and the, uh, overseas production, uh, we would, uh, we would see, uh, copycat pads. We, we, we had a, so on, on this shape, we had a trademark on the shape, on the eight sided shape. Um, and we, we, we stopped copycat pads coming in at customs. I had a, I had a, a patent trademark attorney and mm. she I, I got wind of something through somebody that a shipment was coming to a certain distributor and it was a real field knockoff and uh, we we actually stopped them at the border um, wow so the, so the competition was increasing um we were making a uh pad for zildjian at the time that they called z pad um but i just thought like i said we had taken it as far as as we could, and uh, that I thought that I, I I would explore selling the company. Uh, one other thing that contributed to that was uh, so Guitar Center was a great customer for for HQ Percussion. It was kind of funny 
when I had my drum headquarters hat on, I did everything I could do to beat them. And when I had my HQ percussion <laughs> hat on, I did everything I, I could do for them to buy as yeah. many real feel and sound offs <laughs> as possible. And yeah. they, they did that for, for 12 or 13 years. Um, and, uh, eventually they replaced our products with, uh, Vic Firth knockoffs. Um, and Vic was a dear friend. Um, yeah, yeah. Because of price. It was very similar. Because of price. Yeah. Um, so first they dropped real feel. Um, and then about a six or 12 months later, they dropped sound off uh, once Vic got his production up. And at that time, Guitar Center was about 15% of our business, which is healthy. It's nothing like sure. some of these companies when uh, and it doesn't have to be Guitar Center. You know, there's a famous story about uh, Rubbermaid was too committed to Sears. It was like 30 or 40% of their business and Sears cut them off. And Rubbermaid almost went out of business because they had too much yeah. invested in that. So in our case, Guitar Center was fit, was a lot of business, but it was only 15% of our gross. Incredibly, within a year, we recovered all that lost business. Wow. And I'm not really sure. I, 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 I know why on Real Feel. Real Feel was an established name that people asked for, an established brand that people asked for by name. And if they went to a store and the salesperson tried to sell them on something else saying it's the same thing, sure, a number of people would would uh, respond yeah, to that. I'll, but I'll a majority yeah. of people would go somewhere else and get the real feel. They were just, it was like imprinted. They had to have the real feel. Wow. Sound off was more of a commodity. So um, I can understand uh, that the sound off being hurt. But generally speaking, yeah. we replaced all of our lost business within a year or so. And that proved to me that it was a really resilient company. And that was, should be valuable to, to a buyer. Plus I didn't think that would happen a second time. So I didn't want to tempt fate. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so, you got lucky the first time. Yeah, yeah. So I just, I just thought it was time. I really, I really thought sure. we could, we really couldn't take it any farther. Um, and I first reached out to Zildjian and Promark, uh, two companies that I had a long history with and knew all the principles very well. Um, and they both were very interested. Um, Zildjian actually very seriously sent their CFO down for an entire day. He spent three or four hours with uh, my accountant. Um, we spent a lot of time together, uh, but both Zildjian and Promark um, backed off because they had some other corporate challenges. Again, not to get away from their core business, they had some yeah. corporate challenges that they needed to attend to. And there wasn't any big regret on their part, but both of them have mentioned, mentioned to me later that they wish they could have pursued it. Um, and I didn't want to play this. Uh, I didn't want to have a cattle call and play this one company against another. So that's why I didn't, even though I held Diderio in high regard, that's why I didn't contact them. I thought it'd be enough to deal with Zildjian and Promark in the beginning. So when yeah. when they both declined, eventually after a month or two of discussions, I went to D'Addario and um, the person I talked with, who I knew very well at the time, John Roderick, the uh, manager of of uh, of that division, um, said, "Obviously, we're this is on our drawing board. Practice pads. It fits right into our." our model they're going to you know at, at the time all they had was evans within percussion they had nothing mm -hmm. else percussion wise they didn't own promark yet um so because he because we knew each other uh he put me in touch with the uh, ceo at the time who uh i didn't know and that was who they wanted to negotiate because they you know uh diderio has extremely high standards. They were an ISO 9001 company at the time. They had to follow all those protocols and uh, sure. needed to be totally objective. So I started meeting with the uh, the CEO and, and he made at least, he made one trip uh, down. Uh, we had to be kind of surreptitious about it. But uh, yeah, he made a trip down because um, it wouldn't be odd for the CEO of D'Addario to visit a drum shop. But we spent a lot of time after hours at the HQ percussion facility. And yeah, 
they they were unbelievable in what they requested of me. Um, hmm. For a while, I thought this is crazy um, <laughs> because yeah. they wanted they wanted to know down to the drop of glue what it costs to make every product. Something I had never done. I did this whole thing from my gut. Yeah, yeah, that's next level. I mean, that is right. Like, exactly. Uh, I've I've had things with yeah. work through video and audio stuff where it's like once you get to a bigger company, yes. it's like oh, this takes six months to get something through the the right. chain of command. But yeah. I realized in the middle of this, even if they don't buy the company, they made me peel away so many layers of the onion that if they didn't buy the company, I was going to know so much more about yeah. HQ percussion than I knew when the <laughs> process started. Yeah. Um, but fortunately, uh, fortunately, they they decided to go ahead. And um, it was, you know, I had met with, um, you know, my attorney a little bit, but mainly my accountants. And they have been through this with other clients. And they told me some of the horror stories and how rough this can be. And you might get a deal where, you know, the contract says it's got to require this kind of sales or growth or the deal's void or, or the deal gets discount or whatever. None of that. Yeah. It was just a, it was a, a wonderful, mutually respectful uh, experience. Awesome. I, I couldn't say enough about, about the company. Um, and, cool. uh, well, it's a success story. I mean, you, you, you did it, you saw a product, you made it better. <clears throat> uh, you got, criticism from joe morello you kept <laughs> right. going <laughs> but really it was a big success and i mean you worked hard with both of your kind of big endeavors that you did and it paid off and it's just cool to hear about that it's like well that's business yeah, success yeah. in our that, industry. that's about sweating that's about back to sweating the details but the reality is didario bought the brand names i mean sure they yeah. bought they bought the brand names and the reputation the reputation they're, yeah. they were they are very capable of maintaining because of their customer service and but they bought the brand names and they cut down the learning sure. curve they just hit i mean they hit the ground running and because of their reach i mean we had we had 12 uh foreign countries we had just distribution in 12 foreign countries at the time um maybe 15 maybe 20 percent of our business was overseas but hmm. the dario has so much worldwide distribution and leverage on their on their distributors that you know you, you, that you've got the Evans drum heads, you've got the Diderio strings, you've got the planet waves. Now you're going to distribute HQ percussion in this country because the regular HQ percussion distributor can't have it anymore. Or yeah. there's 20 other countries where we never were. So I would say, I would say within three to six months, they probably increased our sales by 30% just by leveraging their worldwide wow. distribution. Good for everyone. So, yeah. Man, yeah. unbelievable. This is like, uh, this is the kind of information that you can't get from anyone else except you who was there and who did it. And uh, it's just an amazing story uh, start to finish. So, wow. You should, you should, I'm sure you are. You should feel very <laughs> proud for, for doing that. And I'm sure now you can sit back and kind of look at it all. Yeah, and just go, yeah, you know, I, I did that. I mean, I, believe me, this wasn't a solo project. I at yeah. drum headquarters and HQ percussion, I had incredibly dedicated long-term employees. Uh, I, I had employees for 10 to 25 years, 22 years. We had teachers for 10 to 20 years. Um, we, we just, I, I just had a, a bunch of great guys who, you know, ate, slept and drank drums and, uh, and, and, and that, that was really, that was really the key. Yeah. Wow. I think that's like a good, good way to wrap this up. I think you've covered the story beautifully and, uh, uh, without too much info as we kind of wrap up, you, you actually originally reached out with some clarification about DW Tama Camco <laughs> right. stuff with me and, um, Vincent Ward sure. from, um, Vitalizer Drums, who's been on before Vincent's going to come on again and do another episode soon. And, uh, he and I'll cover that info and sure. all that stuff. Good, but, good, um, good. Rob, this has been awesome, man. Like I said, I can't get this info anywhere else. Um, I want to just mention too, because I'm sure our, my, my friends at, there's a, uh, vintage, um, practice pad Facebook page where I, I hope they're listening. There's Beth Harmon and, uh, Mark Beecher and Michael Windish and these people who love practice pads. So there's really a, um, big community of practice pad fans and a lot others. I'm sure I'm forgetting some names, but, 
Um, I'm sure they're getting a kick out of your info because uh, it is really it's drum history. It's practice pad history. It's a lot of stuff. So um, I hope they enjoyed it. Um, Rob is kind enough. It's been a while since I've done one. He's going to hang out and we're going to do a bonus episode, uh, which is going to be on Patreon. And Rob has, which I haven't heard the full thing. I got some some small details. Rob's got an amazing story about being invited to the Yamaha factory uh, in Japan, right? And then creating um, a drum set. And it was 9-11, like right. uh, September 11th, right. uh, 2001, which was Correct. a famous day, obviously, for many for that, you know, terrible reason. But um, so we're going to talk about that. If you want to hear that and like 70 other bonus episodes, go to um, patreon.com slash drum history podcast, I believe. Go to the link in the description and you'll see it there. Um, so thank you for being here, Rob. I appreciate it. My pleasure. It. My pleasure.